This next section is looking at the particle wave duality. And the photoelectric effect demonstrated that light, usually considered to be a wave, can also have the properties of particles, albeit without mass. That is, there's a wave particle duality associated with light. Is there anything else that exhibits wave particle duality? The particle properties of matter, electrons, for example, are well known. And J.J. Thompson actually showed this in his experiment to determine a charge to mass ratio of an electron. And he generated a beam of electrons. When the electrons hit the screen, the beam uh, gave rise to tiny flashes of colored light. So this phenomenon is best explained if we picture electrons as being particles. But does matter also exhibit wave properties? Um, this question was thought about by a guy named Louis de Broglie, and this short little clip is going to give you a little bit of a background. So in the early 20th century, physicists were bamboozled because light, which we thought was a wave, started to behave in certain experiments as if it were a particle. So for instance, there was an experiment done called the photoelectric effect, where if you shine light at a metal, It'll knock electrons out of the metal if that light has sufficient energy. But if you tried to explain this using wave mechanics, you get the wrong result. And it was only by resorting to a description of light as if it could only deliver energy in discrete packets that Einstein was able to describe how this photoelectric effect worked and predict the results that they actually measured in the lab. In other words, light was only giving energy in certain bunches equal to something called Planck's constant multiplied by the frequency of the light. It either gave all of this energy to the electron or it gave none of the energy to the electron. It was never half and half. It never gave half of this energy. It was sort of all or nothing. But this was confusing to people because we thought we had established that light was a wave and we thought that because if you shine light through a double slit, if it were a particle, if light were just a bunch of particles, you would expect particles to just either go through the top hole and give you a bright spot right here, or go through the bottom hole, give you a bright spot right here. But what we actually measure when you do this experiment with light is that the light seemingly diffracts from both holes, overlaps, and it gives you a diffraction pattern on the screen. So instead of just two bright spots, it gives you this constructive and destructive pattern that would only emerge if the light beam were passing through both slits and then overlapping the way waves would out of two holes on this other side of the double slit. So this experiment showed that light behaved like a wave, but the photoelectric effect showed that light behaved more like a particle, and this kept happening. You kept discovering different experiments that showed particle-like behavior, or different experiments that showed wave-like behavior for light. Finally, physicists resigned to the fact that light can seemingly have particle-like properties and wave-like properties depending on the experiment being conducted. So that's where things sat when in 1924, a young French physicist, a brilliant young physicist named Louis de Broglie, now it looks like you pronounce this Louis de Broglie, and that's what I always said. I always read this and I said de Broglie in my mind, and I knew that wasn't right. If you look it up, it's more like Louis de Broglie. So get rid of all that, replace it with a Y in your mind. Louis de Broglie in 1924 wrote a paper and he did something no one else was doing. Everyone else was worried about light and light behaving like a particle or a wave depending on the experiment. Louis de Broglie said this, what about the electron? You got this electron flying off here. He said, if light, which we thought was a wave, can act like a particle, maybe electrons, which we thought were particles, can act like a wave. In other words, maybe they have a wavelength associated with them. He was trying to synthesize these ideas into one overarching framework in which you could describe both quanta of light, i.e. particles of light, and particles, which we thought were just particles, but maybe they can behave like waves as well. So maybe he was saying everything in the universe can behave like a particle or a wave depending on the experiment that's being conducted. And he set out to figure out what would this wavelength be. He figured it out. It's called the de Broglie wavelength. Oh, I reverted. Sorry. De Broglie wavelength, not the de Broglie wavelength. The de Broglie wavelength, he figured it out and he realized it was this. So he actually postulated it. He didn't really prove this. He motivated the idea 
And then it was up to experimentalists to try this out. So he said that the wavelength associated with things that we thought were matter, so sometimes these were called matter waves, but the wavelength of, say, an electron is going to be equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum of that electron. And so, and so why did he say this? Why did he pick Planck's constant? Which, by the way, if you're not familiar with Planck's constant, it is, like the name suggests, just a constant. And it's always the same value. It's 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds. It's really small. This was a constant discovered in other experiments like this photoelectric effect. And then uh, we go on. So our book actually is a little bit more specific than just saying momentum, because we know that, let me go forward here, we know that momentum is mass times velocity. So um, we'll be looking at Planck's constant over mass times velocity. So going off of that, if light can be viewed in terms of both wave and particle properties, why can't particles of matter like electrons be treated the same way? So looking at de Broglie's, um, or Louis de Broglie, not de Broglie, but it looks like, I know, I also pronounce it like that too. Um, he tells us that matter has wave properties. So we're able to measure the wavelength um, is equal to Planck's constant divided by momentum or mass times velocity. Here we're given Planck's constant. So the matter has wave properties, not observable for big pieces of matter like golf balls, but for small pieces of matter like electrons. So for example, if we, it, it's something that needs to be measurable. So the product of m times v needs to be, has to be, very small because h is so small. So like a golf ball, let's say this golf ball is 82.5 grams and it's moving at a velocity of 255 kilometers per hour, like 150 miles per hour. Um, this m times v is going to be huge. So to have a wavelength of 1.13 times 10 to the negative 34th meters, um, that is such a small value, it cannot be measured with any instrument. So, and, and it's not a meaningful value. So because of this, wave properties are never assigned to any kind of massive objects. It is possible to observe wave-like properties only for particles of extremely small mass, like protons, neutrons, and electrons. For an example, here would be the wavelength of an electron. If I have a, here's my mass of the electron and there's my velocity, my speed, and if I did Planck's constant divided by this product, I would get a wavelength of 2.43 times 10 to the negative 11th. Small particle, longer wavelength. Here's the sample problem for you to try. I want you to calculate the wavelength associated with an electron mass of 9.109 times 10 to the negative 28th grams that travels at 40% of the speed of light. Remember, the speed of light is 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So pause this, and we'll go over the answer in a minute. All right. If I were to take my mass that I was given, the 9.109 times 10 to the negative 31, I got this number, 1.199 times 10 to the eighth, because I took 2.998 times 10 to the eighth and times it by 0.4 to get this. So I have my mass, I have my velocity, and I have Planck's constant. So do Planck's constant divided by this product, and I should get 6.07 times 10 to the negative 12 meters convert our meters into nanometers, um, and we would have one meter on the bottom to 10 to the ninth nanometers on top to get 6.07 times 10 to the negative third nanometers. Here's another one I'd like for you to try. Calculate the wavelength associated with a neutron that has a mass of 1.675 times 10 to the negative 24th grams and it has a kinetic energy of 6.21 times 10 to the negative 21 joules. Knowing and remembering from way back when 
Ke equals one half mv squared. How does this help us get to what we need in order to find wavelength? So pause this, take a minute, try it out, and we'll go over the answer in a minute. All right, hopefully you had a chance to process this. Uh, first, I need to find the velocity because I was given the mass. So to rearrange one half mv squared and solve for velocity, I would get 2,723 meters per second. Make sure that you get that. Again, this is one half mv squared. I had to pull v out of it to get my velocity. Then I can plug it into de Broglie's equation. Planck's constant divided by m times v. And then again, once I get my answer, I'm going to times it by 10 to the ninth to get 0 0.0145 nanometers. All of that leads us to our next section, the modern view of electronic structure, wave or quantum mechanics. So how does wave particle duality affect our modern, our model of the arrangement of electrons and atoms? Well, three scientists helped contribute to this and provided our answer. We've got Schrodinger, we've got Born, and we have Heisenberg. So starting with de Broglie's hypothesis that an electron could be described as a matter wave, Schrodinger developed a model for electrons and atoms that has come to be called quantum mechanics or wave mechanics. So unlike Bohr's model, Schrodinger's model is a little more difficult to visualize and the math equations are pretty complicated. But understanding it is essential to understanding the modern view of the atom. So first, uh, he described the behavior of an electron in the atom as a standing wave. If you tie down a string at both ends, as you would like the string of a guitar, and then pluck it, the string vibrates as a standing wave. And you can show that there are only certain vibrations allowed for these standing waves, meaning the vibrations are quantized. Similarly, Schrodinger showed only certain matter waves are possible for an electron in an atom. Now to describe these waves, go back here, uh, physicists defined a series of mathematical equations called wave functions which are designated this wave function by this um, Greek letter psi, P-S-I. And when these equations are solved for energy, we find some important outcomes. These outcomes are only certain wave functions are found to be acceptable and each is associated with an allowed energy value. So the energy of the electron in the atom is quantized. And secondly, the solution to Schrodinger's equation for an electron in three-dimensional space depends on three integers, n, l, and ml, which are called quantum numbers. And we're going to get into these quantum numbers in just a few minutes. Only certain combinations of their values are possible. An interesting little side note from the book In Search of Schrodinger's Cat. If it, were pos if it were ever possible to know the position and velocity of every particle in the universe, then it would be possible to predict with utter precision the future of every particle and therefore the future of the universe. Now, as we try to kind of wrap our brain around the modern quantum mechanical model, in Bohr's model of the atom, both the energy and the location, so the orbit, that that electron was found in. The energy and the orbit that the electron and the hydrogen atom could be found um, descri were described accurately. So we knew those locations. However, Heisenberg postulated that for a tiny object such as an electron and an atom, it's impossible to determine accurately both its position and its energy. So any attempt to determine accurately either the location or the energy will leave the other one uncertain. So this is now known as Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. If you choose 
to know the energy of an electron in an atom with only a small uncertainty, then we must accept a correspondingly large uncertainty in its position. So why is this important? Because we can assess like the likelihood or the probability of finding an electron with a given energy in a given region of space. And because energy is key to understanding the chemistry of an atom, chemists accept the notion that knowing only the approximate location of the electron is okay. So the energy is what we're able to focus on. The wave function for an electron in an atom describes an atomic orbital. We know the energy of this electron, but we only know the region of space within which it is most probably located. When an electron has a particular wave function, and remember that wave function is psi, telling us that probability, it's said to occupy a particular orbital with a given amount of energy. So we're gonna look at some of these different orbitals. Each orbital is described by three quantum numbers. These quantum numbers are terms that arise from the mathematics of the Schrodinger equation. They describe the location of an electron in a particular orbital, much like a, your house address. So each electron has its own set of three quantum numbers. The principal quantum number, n, this refers to, and the principal quantum number can have any integer value from one to infinity, the value of n is the primary factor in determining the energy of an orbital. It also defines the size of an orbital. So the greater the value of n, the greater the size of the orbital. So this is um, one, two, three, four, all the way on up. But in atoms having more than one electron, two or more electrons may have the same n value. These electrons are said to be in the same energy electron shell. So if we're looking at our periodic table, our periodic table currently has seven rows or seven shells of electrons. So N thinking one through seven currently. Um, then we have L. This is a, a cursive L our angular quantum number. So the orbitals of a given electron shell are then in subshells. So this is my electron shell. This is my subshell, where each subshell is characterized by a different value of quantum number L. This refers to as the orbital angular momentum. And it can have any integer value from zero to a maximum of n minus one. So this is an n minus one. If I have, if my principal quantum number was three, then this would be three minus one, two. This L defines the characteristic shape of an orbital. Okay, so different L values correspond to different orbital shapes. For example, if N is equal to one, then N minus one would be zero, and zero corresponds to the S subshell. Remember when we were doing electron configuration and we had S, P, D, and F? S is our S subshell. We know that there's one orbital because we know that the S can hold two electrons. Um, S is a spherical shaped orbital. If we had L of one, that would mean that we had an N value of two because down here two minus one would be one. So we had a two and if you think about this and you look at your periodic table, if I had an n value of one, think about my first period in my periodic table. There's only s electrons, hydrogen and helium, right? I don't have 1p electrons. So 
So I can't have one here and then one, uh, a value of one here to have p electrons. So um, same with s, we have s, we have p, we, um, we know that we have d electrons. d electrons are in my third energy shell. And if I have an N of three, that means three minus one is two. And if I look at this, L of two is equal to D subshell. We know that in my fourth period, I have four minus, um, in my fourth period, I have three D electrons, right? So I have D subshell for my third, um, uh, my 3D. So since N defines principal energy level, if there are N subshells, one, we would have L as zero. If there was two, if N was equal to two, two, L can have values of zero and one. We know that in our second energy um, level in row two, I can I have two S's and I have two P's, so I can have an L of zero and one. So I'm not just limited to saying n minus one is one. I have one and I have zero available. So S and P zero corresponds with S, right? And one corresponds with P. If I have three, so my maximum L. 3 minus 1 is 2. I can have 2 and 1 and 0. So at n equals 3, I can have 3 d electrons, 3 p electrons, and 3 s electrons. And then finally, our last ML, the magnetic quantum number. This is related to the orientation in space of the orbitals within a subshell. Orbitals in a given subshell are different in their orientation in space, not in their energy. So we can have a range from positive L to negative L with zero included. For example, if L is equal to two, all right, so let's say our L is two, that means we have D up to D, we have S, P, and D. Then I can have plus or minus, so if we said if L is equal to two, I can have minus two all the way up to plus two. If I could have negative two, negative one, zero, positive one, and positive two. The number of values of ML for a given subshell is equal to two L plus one. And that's the number of orbitals in the subshell. So if L was equal to two, then that would mean N was equal to three. So if I had something in my third energy shell, so my L would be three minus one, which is two. That means I can have two, one, and zero for my L's. I can have D, P, and S. And then to figure out quantum numbers, it's the integer between negative L and positive L. So if I said negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. And how many would I have if L was two? Two times two is four plus one is five. So I would have five, one, two, three, four, five numbers. So then looking a little bit closer, if we said that L was equal to one, no, actually if L was equal to zero, if we did two times zero, that would be zero plus one, that would be one, we would have one number. And in this case, if L is zero, ML is zero. That's the only option it could be. If L was one, if I did two times one, plus one, so that's two plus one is three. I'm gonna have three values for ML. They could either be zero, plus one, or minus one. Those are 
three values right there. And again, if I have a value of one, it can be minus one, plus one, and the zero that's in between. Same with if L is two. That means I will have negative two all the way up to positive two with the whole numbers in between. Negative two, negative one, zero, uh, uh, negative one, and positive two. All right, so let's do some examples here. Let's say that we have a first electron shell, so n is equal to 1. That means that L is 1 minus 1, so L is equal to 0. And remember, L is going to tell us that we have an s orbital. And so ML is equal to 2 times L, so 2 times 0, plus 1. So I'm going to have one subshell that exists. And that would be, my answer would be 0. Right? Because it has to be um, my plus or minus my L. And so 0 is going to be 0. 0 is included. So this means that the shell that's closest to the nucleus there's one subshell that exists, and that subshell consists of only a single orbital, the 1s electron. Let's look at if n equals 2. All right, so that means that L, 2 minus 1, so we can have 1 and zero. So there are two subshells in the second shell. And if you think about it, in my second period, I have 2s and 2p. So that's telling me zero corresponds to s and one corresponds to p. We have s and p. Um, and so then therefore ml is 2m plus 1. So that would give me 2 times 1 plus 1 is 3. So we will have three values of ML. And again, we got to do um, negative 1, because my L was 1, comma, 0, comma, and plus 1. Those are my three values for ml. So three 2p orbitals exist. All three orbitals have the same shape. However, each has a different ml value, so the three orbitals differ in their orientation in space. Let's look at a third, the third energy shell. So if n equals 3, Three subshells are possible for the electron. These values for L, because 3 minus 1, or n minus 1, is 2. So I can have 2, 1, and 0. That tells me I, in um, this, we can have S. P and D in my third energy level, right? S, P, and D. All right, and then we will look at ML. Yeah, 2 times L, which we said L was 2. 2 times L plus 1, 2, 4 equals 5. And then that's plus and minus what I came up with for L. So that is negative 2, negative 1, 0, positive 1, positive 2. All right, so ML can have five values. There are five d orbitals in this d subshell. Let's look at n equals 4. So in our fourth electron shell. 
that means that we have 4 minus 1, we have 3, we have 2, we have 1, we have 0. So there are 4, so we have 4s, 4p, 4d, 4f, for l equals 3. We have s, 1 is p, 2 is d, 3 is f suborbitals. And for ML, we would have 4 minus 1 is 3. 3 times 2 is 6 plus 1 is 7. And again, it's plus or minus 3. So minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, those would be 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Seven values for ML. Here's a little quote by Ernest Rutherford. If you want to pause and read it, it's kind of interesting looking at the theory of quantum mechanics, how bizarre it may appear. And it is so in some respects, but it is now possible to understand and explain things. So, we often say an electron is assigned to, or that it occupies an orbital. But what does this mean? What is an orbital? What does it look like? So we have to look at the wave functions for the orbitals to help us understand this. To answer the question of why the quantum numbers, small whole numbers, that can be related to orbital shape and energy, we need to get a little bit more in depth here. So. You know, orbitals are where an electron can be found in an atom. We know that they have a characteristic size and shape. N, L, M, L. All right, we just covered all of this. Here's a little bit of a summary. This all helps us describe an orbital. A set of four quantum numbers describes an electron. No two electrons can have an identical set of four quantum numbers. So we have S orbitals, P and D. We're not really going to get into F. But to uh, give you a quick quiz along the way, though, which of the following numbers is not a valid set of quantum numbers? So if I had N equals 4, would L equal, can L equal 1? And can there be M L of negative 1? If N is equal to 6, if N is equal to 2, if N is equal to 3. Hopefully you would look at this and you would go, well, L has to be at least minus N minus 1. So yes, 1 is a possibility for L. That's less than 1. This is less than 1. But we can't have L equal to N. So this would not be possible. How about this? For a certain orbital, if N is equal to 3, L is 1, and ML is negative 1, what type of orbital is this? If you were to just go off of what you know, Hopefully you're understanding that this is which period we're in. So we're in period three. And remember, L corresponds to the shape. So remember, zero is S, and then P, and then D, and then F. So zero is S, one is P. So this is a 3P orbital. What about this one? If an electron subshell has seven orbitals, what is the L value for this subshell? Well, we get orbitals by 2L plus 1. So we would need to do 3 times 2, right? 3 times 2 is 6 plus 1 is 7 would give me the seven orbitals. So answer has to be three. All right, so let's get into the shapes of orbitals. First, we're gonna look at the S orbitals. 
Um, S orbitals are spherical in shape. And if we were to look at, this is looking at uh, hydrogen 1S, and this is looking specifically at a dot picture where each dot represents the position of an electron at a different instance in time. And the dots clusters are most dense, closest to the nucleus. Um, this one is showing us the plot for the surface density um, as a function of distance for a hydrogen atom. Again, this is for 1s. And it shows the probability of finding the electron at a given distance from the nucleus. And again, you can see this. It's most probable, like, pretty close to the nucleus. And then the further you get away from it, the less probability of finding those electrons. So um, close to the nucleus, as we can see from here. Then after P or after S, we get into P orbitals. And this is for all atomic orbitals where L is equal to 1, because we know if L is or if L is 0, it's S. If L is 1, we've got P. They have the same basic shape. Um, the P orbital kind of looks like a dumbbell. Um, a P orbital has a nodal surface, a surface on which the probability of finding the electron is 0 that passes through the nucleus. And we can see the nucleus smack dab there. This is our nodal planes. Um, there are three p orbitals in a p subshell. Uh, they all have the same basic shape with one nodal plane through the nucleus. And then we get into d orbitals. So if you remember, when we have l equals zero, remember l is our shape, so zero is s. Those are s orbitals. There are no nodal surfaces through the nucleus. p orbitals where L is one, so S, P, P orbitals have one nodal surface through the nucleus. The value of L is equal to the number of nodal surfaces slicing through the nucleus. So if L is equal to two, so zero is S, one is P, two is D. Two is telling me that my D orbitals have two nodal planes. So instead of our p orbitals, where we have one slice going through it, through the nucleus, our d orbitals have two nodal planes, two slices. Um, so resulting in four regions of electron density. You can kind of see how these slice, how along the x and the y axes, or where those slice planes are. So that's where our electron density is uh, the greatest. And then of course there are also F orbitals, um, super complex. Um, there are seven F orbitals. So L equals three. So there's three nodal surfaces through the nucleus, um, which causes the electron density to lie up to eight regions of space. All right. Well, we just wrapped up talking about the different orbitals, S, P, D, and F. So there is one more electron property, the electron spin. And this is an important role in the arrangement of electrons in atoms. So back in the early 1900s, Stern and Gerlich performed an experiment that probed the magnetic behavior of atoms by passing a beam of silver atoms in the gas phase through a magnetic field. The results were best interpreted by imagining the electron has a spin and behaves as a tiny magnet that can be attracted or repelled by another magnet. If atoms with a single unpaired electron are placed in the magnetic field, the stern gerlach experiment showed there are two orientations for the atoms, with the electron spin aligned with the field or opposed to the field. So the electron spin is quantized. This fact is accounted for by introducing a fourth quantum number, the electron spin quantum number, also called MS. And one orientation is associated with a value of positive one, 
and another with a negative, I'm sorry, positive one half, and then the other with a negative one half. <clears throat> and this shows us the positive one half and the negative one half. So positive for spin up, negative one half for spin down. So now, so it is, it was recognized that electron spin being quantized. So a complete description of an electron in any atom requires four quantum numbers, N, L, ML, and MS. This final property wraps up our chapter six, which is the structure of atoms. So please refer to the module for some supplemental materials and discussion board and extra practice homework problems.